has the EU ever given us? Obscure laws and regulations, straight bananas and public infrastructure, agricultural subsidies and human rights, the four freedoms, like anybody needed them. Come on now, how are we supposed to even celebrate something that hasn't ever given us a bank holiday yet? It's Europe Day, and I, for one, think it should be an international holiday instead of, you know, just another day when business goes as usual. Business as usual is anyway quite a jarring issue within the EU. Out of 705 MPs in European Parliament, we had six younger than 30, now we have just three. People above 30 in my book don't count as young. When it comes to the far right, you're quite right, I think, to underscore that the younger generations are streaming into all sorts of milieus uh, of politics, including the far right. We used to be the, the continent of wars, that, that was our main sport. And then we managed to find a way to live together in peace and relative harmony. Maybe we are in a new phase, at least in the center of Europe. The word of the day is like authenticity. You cannot learn it. Low-level initiatives uh, really are the building blocks for building these great cathedrals of, of participation, of feeling engaged in your community and feeling a part of something much larger. Welcome to Standard Time, a Eurozine production. This is a digital talk show with guests from all over Europe discussing Europe. I'm Reiko Kingapop, editor-in-chief of Eurozine, the magazine presenting you this show. Since this is a digital production, you get to watch it on your own time, your respective Standard Time. I say watch it, but we also started to publish our episodes in a podcast format, and you can find them both on displayeurope.eu. Just look for Standard Time Talk Show on any podcast app or your usual video platforms, but also Come check out Display Europe. This is a content sharing platform offering you content in 15 European languages. And also, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Today, we're talking all about shrinking civic spaces, your skepticism, and disengaging from political institutions. Such fun topics for Europe Day, which is today, by the way. The 9th of May marks the anniversary of the 1950 Schuman Declaration, which proposed the creation of a European coal and steel community that would merge economic interests and become a first step toward a unified Europe. In the aftermath of the Second World War, the prospect of peace and unity brought countries together, eventually birthing the European Parliament in 1958. The EU has grown exponentially since then, both geographically and institutionally. It has weathered the protest and reform movements of the stormy 60s, economic crises galore, the collapse of the Soviet experiment, the introduction of the Eurozone, a huge wave of expansions, some more financial crises, Brexit, the ever-deepening refugee crisis, COVID-19, Russia's most recent war on Ukraine, and, you know, everything else in between. I'm going to spare you the history lesson because... Boy, do I have a lot to say about the present and not enough time to cover the past, or the future, for that matter. Along with the rise of right-wing populism, social fragmentation, and the layers and layers of economic crisis affecting us, Euroscepticism has been on a steady rise for at least a decade now. One core problem is that the population of the member states tends to engage with the EU through their local politics. Now, local politics, especially populists, can obscure this relationship and it shows in the clearly manufactured EU skepticism that led to the disaster of Brexit or, closer to home for me, the government-induced anti-EU sentiment in Hungary, where the Orban regime blames Brussels for even the weather. European parliamentary elections tend to have lower attendance than national and local elections do. And this is due to the reason that, for most citizens, EU elections just feel too far removed from their daily lives and are considered kind of secondary. After witnessing declines in voter turnouts, the EU's reputation does seem to have improved since the last 2019 elections, though. In comparison to 2014, there was a 50% increase in young voters, for example. That's a huge success, but admittedly, we started from a devastatingly low point. Many outreach strategies have been planned for this year's vote, but we're yet to see how effective they will be. 
Now, despite the increase in the number of young voters in the past five years, many are still disengaged, with some not even having any idea when voting dates are in their respective countries. So check out this chart to find out yours and to cast your vote between the 6th and the 9th of June. With technologization, the nature of voting has also drastically changed. Over half of the EU's youth rely on social media for information, which makes them quite susceptible to digital propaganda. The far right has discovered TikTok, for instance, and is now using it to gain votes. Who would have thought that the rule of unsubstantiated, sensationalist soundbites would favor extremism? Wait, I think everybody knew so. Democracy and democratic participation in the EU is one of the highlight topics of the Maastricht debates, where the top candidates of European parties address three priorities chosen by young Europeans. The two other themes are climate change and foreign policy, which we will also be covering on this show in the coming months as the European parliamentary elections unfold. So subscribe and come back for more. But today's focus is democratic participation in the EU, and frankly, it's not looking all that dandy. A voluntary federation, the EU represents a unique mass of power and economic potential. It's a driver of innovation and important adaptations and one of the biggest donors on planet Earth. Yet, it struggles to uphold its claimed values of rule of law, freedom, equality, human dignity and, well, human rights. How can this loose and undisciplined superpower ensure socioeconomic cohesion, combat disinformation, foster solidarity and dialogue and promote a positive and inclusive European identity? We have our guests to offer strategies. Ivana Dragicevic is an award-winning journalist, author, and the founder of the Europe Future Center. She is the editor-at-large of N1 Television, an exclusive CNN affiliate for the Adria Balkans region. Ivana is the author of multiple documentaries, including the series Voters 2024 and Future of Europe, in cooperation with the European Parliament. She also authored two acclaimed books. One of them is Unequals, on global order and inequality, and Unsecure on the future of security in the world. Ivana is also the person I wish I had turned out to be. Andre Wilkens is the director of the European Cultural Foundation based in Amsterdam, who is the founder and founder of the Display Europe platform and also this show. He is also the board chair of the Tactical Tech Cooperative and the co-founder of the Initiative Offene Gesellschaft and a founding member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. He works on European and international affairs, equality, climate change and a more human digital world. He is the author of two books on Europe and digitalization. Andre is also a professional EU enthusiast who advocates for the 9th of May, Europe Day, to become a public holiday. For a couple of years, he and I have developed a habit of doing yearly sort of evaluation talks. You can find our previous discussions on the Gagarin podcast on the link in the show notes. Michael Zeller is an assistant professor in comparative politics at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in München. He earned his PhD from the Central European University and worked on a project aptly named BRAVE, that is, Building Resilience Against Violent Extremism and Polarization. He is currently a fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, that's where we are right now. He is researching right-wing extremism in Europe. He is a member of the Radicalization Awareness Network Policy Support and the European Research Community on Radicalization Researchers Directory. And today we are hosted by the library of one of my favorite places on Earth, the EVM, the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna. Welcome and thank you for joining me today here uh, and my colleagues at the EVM library. Uh, Let's start with you, Ivana. We are both very, very keen on youth representation and you have picked a bone about this many times and you also have a series. You think that the representation of young people in politics and in political discourse is um, (coughs) lacking in Europe to be very, um, very modest about this. If we look at our political parties and if we look at the European Parliament as it is now uh, until these new elections in 2024, we had out of 705 MPs in European Parliament, we had six younger than 30, now we have just three. Understanding and putting youth on equal foot 
in discussion what democracy is and will be in the future if you want to preserve it. And if we talk about crisis of democracy, mistrust, rising authoritarianism, radicalization, we need to put, I will not use it as a pejorative term, but kids on equal footing with us. We need to have more equality. What democracy means for the next generation is not the same what it meant for us. Digital world change everything and we have now Gen Z and Gen Alpha and all the new generations that are basically having other concepts of the world. And in this time of acceleration of things around us, I think that concept of democracy with political parties, uh, with elections every four years need to, if not change completely, then adapt to this new age. And this is, I think, one of the main reasons we have big uh, mistrust in, let's say, traditional institutions overall. People above 30 in my book don't count as young. We're not the young people, for heaven's sake. Young people are supposed to be much younger. And I think this applies in many professional fields. Andre, um, you tend to be very positive and, and find the positive scenarios. So when it comes to political uh, representation and participation in the EU, do you see a positive trajectory for the current situation to improve? Last week um, I was in Berlin and it is an initiative coming from um, different universities in Europe, starting at the University in Groningen, of law students, all between um, 19 and 21. And then uh, they have come together and they went to their professors and said, we want to start an initiative to um, get the vote out in the European Parliament elections. Within weeks, they have set up um, this initiative, um, um, get out the vote um, for our rule of law, and 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 they have uh, generated support. They have uh, done TikTok videos and and all sorts of things. Read statistics about um, um, uh, media consumption, which is going down. Also the sort of disinterest in in the political system, and then you see sort of um, things like that, which is sort of very heartwarming and also sees that there is something and maybe we don't see everything uh, amid all the statistics and the uh, sort of opinion polls and, and so on. One of their professors said, you know, go to the European Culture Foundation because they have a um, they have a fund for this. And for the first time, actually, they, they have some money to cover their, their travel before they did it all themselves. I mean, these people, they are not saying we are now um, strengthening democracy or whatever. They're saying young people have to vote. We, <laughs> we middle-aged, older people, um, don't see because it doesn't fit into our prison um, of, of how we look at the democratic system. My generation, which is Generation X, so millennials, has been among the most depoliticized, apolitical, disengaged. And younger generations seem to be much more engaged, uh, both in public discourse and cultural part participation. It's naturally stronger political engagement for all sorts of sides. And Michael, you study uh, radicalization and strategies to tackle radicalization. Are young people more likely to end up on the far right? Is there like a gender uh, issue there or a class issue there or a historical heritage? How do we understand what's going on now? This perception of the youth as depoliticized or at least today's youth as uh, politically uninvolved is is misleading and there's a lot of political energy. Um, so even as some or maybe a large proportion might be uh, disinterested in the political system, they are interested in politics. When it comes to the far right, you're quite right, I think, to underscore that uh, you know, the younger generations are streaming into all sorts of milieus uh, of politics, including the far right, and in some countries a disproportionate amount are attracted by some of the narratives uh, promoted by far-right actors. Overwhelmingly, young men are more attracted to the far-right. Is it the ideology itself that repels women or attracts men more, or is this like some kind of an institutional or cultural thing? Some are genuinely attracted by the ideology and the narratives promoted by actors, but uh, that tends to be the minority. 
Radicalization often unfolds in a relational way. Uh, part of a problem with, with democracy, I think, uh, in this sort of uh, somewhat antiquated party system is that certain parties are not making themselves as available to young people as they should do. Um, and far-right parties overwhelmingly have been quite good at that. Women who are attracted to or get involved with far-right parties, um, sure, many are, are put off by uh, what I think can rightly be seen as, as regressive uh, stances towards women's rights. But far-right female activists try and frame it as something liberating for women and that uh, women should have the right to stay home uh, and do the important work of motherhood uh, and uh, bearing children. I also fantasize about being a trad wife sometimes. So, you know, I, I think I kind of get the appeal, but then, you know, it's kind of a hard question to ask a traditional husband, and can you please financially sustain me and also not beat me maybe? <laughs> Now, some words from today's host. We're here at the EVM Library, that is the library of the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna. This is an institute of advanced study in the humanities and social sciences. The EVM Library is a public, non-lending, open-stack facility distributed throughout the institute. It began with just one bookshelf and has grown to contain around 40,000 volumes of books and periodicals over the years, hosting many archives as well. And now, <laughs> apparently talk shows. Andre, the ECF supports a lot of programs that focus specifically on community participation. These are cultural programs, but they are really strongly community-based. Can you tell us about the logic there and maybe some examples? One, one thing I want to say about the European Cultural Foundation is it, it's been around for 70 years by three middle-aged men. These people were also involved in, in setting up the European Union, but it needs um, a cultural aspect to what they call a grow a European sentiment, a European sense of belonging, because otherwise it wouldn't work. So Robert Schumann was our first board chair. And so we have worked ever since on, on this. A lot of it, uh, we focus on what we call experience Europe, so create opportunities for different Europeans to meet each other. The second thing, and coming back to what we talked about democracy, it's called Imagine Europe. It's um, telling the stories of Europe. We used to be the, the continent of wars. That, that was our main sport. Then we managed to find a way to live together in peace and, 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 and harm, relative harmony. Maybe we are in a new phase, at least in the center of Europe, telling this story but also telling the future stories. What are the utopias of Europe? Our strategy in growing a European sentiment is called Share Europe, Europe and the Public Space, because um, there is a sort of a shrinking public space. And so we think we should use the tools which we have, especially technical tools, to um, build um, a format for, for public discourse around Europe. We have a program called Europe Challenge, um, um, and that works with the libraries. We have 65,000 public libraries in Europe. And I, I think this is a huge resource. So, I mean, we, we want to empower the libraries uh, to create a, a kind of a European public space. So we have been working on this for 70 years and probably we will continue to work on it at least for another 70 years. Full disclosure, we completely stole the idea from you guys to shoot this show primarily in libraries. When we talk about uh, engaging through people, you are very, very involved with uh, encouraging specifically, for instance, influencers or other new media users or new media creators to engage in public discourse. Okay, several things. Intergenerational misunderstanding, for example. You have Margaritis Hinas, who is the EU Commissioner for European Values, whatever that means these days. Taylor Swift is starting her European tour from Paris, asking Taylor Swift to join in to calls of European elections and, as in the United States, call young Europeans to go out and vote because her appeal in the US made a difference and Gen Z in the States voted more Democrat than Trump. In uh, Europe, what we see 
young people basically are more attracted, let's call it that way, I think, to the extreme polarized parts of our political uh, spectrum. Uh, the youngest parts of Europe are three regions of Ireland and the urban centers of France and Belgium. These are young people that are excluded from libraries, from processes, and uh, this is, I think, the main problem in our conversation, that Europe, European political space is not inclusive. And our public space is, again, not stoa or squares or libraries. It's unfortunately TikTok, over which we have a huge international discussion because it is, let's say, it's owned by China. We have algorithms that are putting us, I won't use the matrix metaphor, rabbit holes, but bubbles. And I think that is something that policymakers or NGOs or media are not taking seriously. And we live in a post-truth world, which not, you know, appeared out of nowhere. It was created and it's fostered by what we call in strategical terms foreign influencing. So working with young people and working with their concept of public space media, we come to, let's call them influencers. And if you see politician trying to be a TikToker, it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. If he isn't a genuine person of today, you know, people who are role models from Taylor Swift to, to others, this is their world. And encouraging them, for example, you've mentioned one of these influencers from Croatia, her name is Nina Skočak. What she did the other day, she formed the first list of young people and she will go on EU elections with list of influencers and young people just as an experiment to see, because we have really low turnout in countries like Croatia, Slovenia, Slovakia and Czech Republic. It's 20 something percent for EU elections, which is for me scary. If they can, you know, achieve anything, if they can, you know, gather the, the, the signatures and put their list out there, and I think it's good, you know, old people or us are kind of patronizing them. So demography also spills over or translates to politics, which is for me scary when I see young people, what you are dealing with, applauding young men, applauding Andrew Tate, applauding, you know, the worst misogyny you know, embracing new forms of life as influencers, as TikToks or whatever is crucial for the survival again of what we used to call democracy or what we romantically want to think as this nice European democracy. And if we allow these narratives, false narratives being implemented in our public space within our youth's heads, and spaces where you have schools that cannot be fast enough to, to grasp these changes and these events, then we are screwed. If you want to know more about European news and see what the Display Europe portal has to offer, check out Vox Europe's press review articles and short video recaps. The southeastern part of Europe is a preferred migration route. How do these countries manage arrivals? Claudio Pop takes a closer look in partnership with Display Europe. Also, subscribe to the Display Europe newsletter. Display Europe's newsletter is currently covering the future of food in Europe. This edition delves into the EU's climate policies and greener alternatives. So make sure to subscribe to it to receive all pressing content on the topic from partner journals. Personal is political, what you said. This is like the 68 slogan, but it's still there. Personal is political. Let's be there for them, embracing them, loving these kids. Yeah, and that's, uh, so that's why it reminds me of this time when I was first showing up in bigger protests and, and, and speaking up in media. And, uh, and people, especially people in very established positions, media workers, they would come there uh, and talk to a couple of peers of mine and myself to pontificate that, oh my God, you are the future. And I found it so patronizing because we are, we were back then not the future, we were the present at that point. I think this feeling of disenfran disenfranchisement is very strong in far-right uh, activism, but the feeling or the resentment towards being left out of things seems to be kind of an organizing idea or an organizing experience, isn't it? 
especially in a digital media age, you cannot neatly separate these quite often. Uh, you still have standard old uh, um, far-right national actors that are, are taking an entrepreneurial role towards telling people you should be aggrieved, you're being deprived of something, uh, you're being excluded. Um, malicious or insidious actors who are uh, saying not only are you deprived, but look at these uh, people with migration backgrounds who are getting state benefits. My favorite is when, when I hear it from friends who have emigrated somewhere within the EU, talk about other migrants abusing the welfare systems that they are also using as migrants. Nevertheless, I think it's important to point out that right now, uh, the EU is actually further restricting um, asylum seekers' rights and migration rights from non-EU source countries and is basically enshrining an existing practice that has been abusing existing rights and regulations. It's, it's enshrining as law. Even more so, the, the EU, several national political actors have capitulated to the far right on this, accepting its... Uh, framing of migration issues as a matter of security and limited resources. Centrist uh, actors have said, we have to restrict immigration um, because people are coming uh, here for, to, to take our welfare benefits, um, as opposed to framing it as a, a human rights issue or um, actually an economic boon, which there's plenty of evidence to support that, that uh, inward migration is uh, ultimately a benefit to societies. Ivana, you keep bringing this up, and I think this is really important, that when we talk about the EU, we say Europe, but here we primarily talk about the EU, which is not all of Europe. It's actually a, bit, a smaller part of Europe. Um, we also talk about a lot of residents who don't get to vote and don't get to shape politics uh, through conventional democratic institutions, right? So there are a lot of surveys that say that, you know, politics, so political parties, traditional politics, electoral politics is becoming more and more elite. And this is also one part of this disconnection. If you want to regain trust, if you want to have legitimacy, you either can model it, I don't know, Belgium or Australia, you can make voting ob obligatory. You need to build these safety nets that are important for communities locally. This is something that sounds trivial, but I think in today's world where this you know, social fabric is breaking apart, is crucial. If you have existential struggle, if we have a crisis as we do now with inflation, then we need to find places and spaces, Anders mentioned, you know, this communal centers that attract local youth. We have public service media, which, you know, fell apart in some countries, is some its state above the water and a, a, a side of political influence. But this is something that can help building up overall trust, informational resilience, let's say, because public broadcaster penetrates every household in European Union still, and it's still relevant in every EU country, more or less. With the EP elections coming up, it's so important now, as ever, to find spaces for dialogue that connects Europeans across borders. And that's why we are proud to promote the Europe Talks project, part of the My Country Talks program, encouraging open dialogue between people and institutions with different opinions. Europe Talks is an open space for Europeans to come together to share ideas, find common ground and form strong opinions about the most important issues of today. You can sign up on the link you find in the show notes at mycountrytalks.org. When we talk about existential struggles, housing is unaffordable across all of Europe. I think one of the things that I would very strongly prescribe for say a next European Parliament to tackle and the Commission to tackle on a policy level altogether. Let's jump on the, on the hopeful side of the same coin, the legitimacy of the EU. We know that, um, and we often say this, that the, the sort of ancestor of the European Union came to life right in the aftermath of the Second World War and the immediate 
perspective was peace, establishing peace. As you said, on a continent who, who did wars, hundreds of years of wars, almost as a, uh, as a devastating hobby. Many argue that this is not a strong enough calling card anymore. What are the things that, that we could utilize best to keep uh, the EU cohesive and sort of build it as a stronger alliance? In a way, I, I see the emergence of the European Union as a historical miracle, in a way. After sort of centuries of, of war and hatred, um, one created something. And uh, in, in, a, in a book I wrote on Europe, um, I even uh, called it um, the discreet charm of the bureaucracy. So I, I think it is it is a miracle, in a, and, and I hope it's it's more than a historic moment. I mean, we have now this historic moment of 70 plus plus years. I will do whatever I can um, uh, to make that a very long moment and, and a lasting moment. Now, after the um, invasion in Ukraine, even more. So I, I think actually Europe um, was, and to a certain extent, is a peace machine, but it needs to be reinvented. When I look at TikTok, um, and I have sometimes, uh, you know, I... For me, I'm not, I, this is not me. But at the same time, I realize having influencers is, is the most human thing we had. You know, Jesus was an influencer. Uh, Marx was an influencer. You know, uh, Neil Young and Bob Dylan were influencers. Young people look at other people as influencers, and they are not Ursula von der Leyen or Sheena's or whatever, even if they go on TikTok. <laughs> Uh, the, the stories uh, which are important to me in terms of peace and um, a good life and uh, solving the housing crisis and so on, um, I think that that uh, is important to me, it's, but it's also important for, for other people and young people, and they have to tell the story in a different way to how I would do it, maybe through a book or maybe a talk show, they will do that differently. So see, I told you, this is what Andre does. He like pours will to live into people. That's, I, I love that. Michael, you immediately said you imagined... A... In the midst of a beautiful, inspirational point about uh, what Europe has and can go on to achieve, uh, he snuck in this very um, enjoyable image of Ursula von der Leyen ending all of our press conferences with be sure to like and subscribe. <laughs> and ring the little notification yeah. item. <laughs> yeah, when, when we talk about how Europe should <clears throat> rethink itself, let's also talk about how Europe has to not just rethink, but actually reform itself to properly or better integrate people within, and especially, say, for instance, um, political extremes and, and generational divides. What would your advice be? Kind of if we sum up all the things that we said, I think we, we can find an answer within that. What Andre said, you know, telling a story. But you cannot tell a story in an empty, you know, without an audience. This audience, you need, people need motivation. People need embrace. Because what Andre said, if you look at Ursula von der Leyen and Schinas, it's like something's missing. I'm sorry, guys. The word of the day is like authenticity. You cannot learn it. When I talk to youth in Europe, I ask them, this generation doesn't have experience of a war. I have a son who is 17 who doesn't understand when I tell him when he gets a letter for conscription into the army, which is happening now all around Europe. He doesn't understand what that means. You have a generation now who doesn't know anyone who survived, you know, Second World War, who doesn't know Holocaust survivors. They are being presented by, you know, Hitler meme in their WhatsApp or Telegram groups or some content on TikTok, which is very well masked a thinking or, or a concept that is completely wrong. We do need new oh, fairy tales but fairy tales which can motivate us not to be scared when we go to bed at night, but to dream nicer dreams. A research project you have been involved with for a long time named BRAVE is specifically about building resilience against um, far-right extremism. What would be your advice 
f for people thinking about what the EU, uh, how the EU has to reform itself, has to maybe choose direction, besides, of course, reading your research, which is always a good idea, read research. But besides that, where, where should we start? Dreaming better dreams uh, and underscoring the achievement of peace uh, of Europe um, that is sadly underappreciated because the living memory of war is, is uh, dying out in Europe. But, um, but, but, but uh, uh, to bring this down a little bit, sort of what was some of the larger takeaways of the BRAVE project, uh, and I believe lots of other research, is what we were talking about earlier, uh, building community. A lot of that has exclusively focused on uh, older infrastructure and uh, ignored TikTok and social media and ways to make that community, uh, conception of community, ready for young people. Low-level initiatives uh, really are the building blocks for uh, building these great cathedrals of, of participation, of feeling engaged in your community and feeling a part of something much larger. That feeling of being involved in a European project really does begin with being involved with just a handful of other people. Thank you so much. I'm so heartened now. <laughs> so happy Europe Day, everyone. Thank you all for participating. Um, keep watching. Um, check out displayeurope.eu, which is our joint venture with the ECF and Andreas, kind of the, the driving spirit behind this pretty much, uh, or one of the driving spirits behind this. Uh, and I hope to see you very soon again. Thank you. And what about the pickles? Oh, the pickles are just there. They're just. Okay. I think everybody needs we'll a bit of pickles. We'll have a snack on Europe's day then. We can. Would you like to? Pickled Europe. Yeah. Okay. Cucumbers. Well, we should have said cheers with them. <laughs>